Yeah, so like uh, Nick said, I'm a, just a grad student here at Utah State, and I'm excited to teach you guys some about some of our flies and wasps we have here in Utah. Um, so to start off, I wanted to talk a little bit about what makes a fly a fly and what makes a wasp a wasp. Um, it can get a little bit confusing at times. Um, so first off, some of the fly characteristics we like to look for is that the eyes are large and round and cover the majority of the face. Um, they have fairly short antennae. Sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. Um, the body shape is usually a lot more stout and you can't see the waist as much as with the wasps, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. Um, and then they only have one pair of wings. Wasps will actually have two pairs of wings. Um, sometimes you can see on flies a little residual, they're called haltiers. Um, where the second pair of wings were at one point. Um, but it gets a little tricky because some flies are wasp mimics or bee mimics. So that's where we'll get a little confusing. But um, in general for wasps, you'll look for more narrow eyes, longer antennas. They'll generally have a smooth, slim body with a fairly tiny little waist. Um, so those are some good ways you can tell them apart. Wasps, when they're flying, will also tend to dangle their legs a little bit. So, and then I'll just throw this one up here for fun. Here's your bees, <laughs> um, in case you're wondering. I'm not gonna talk very much about bees, but um, there's a couple characteristics for them as well. So we're talking about beneficials today. So I have two types of beneficials I want to talk about. We have predator beneficials and parasitoid beneficials. Um, and we'll talk about what's the difference between those in a second, but here's just a brief outline of some of the um, insects I'm gonna go over. We have hoverflies, hornets, yellow jackets, paper wasps, tachinid flies, feather-legged flies, and then a whole load of parasitoid wasps. There's lots of them, but I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. So there's a very fine line between parasites and parasitoids. Most of what we'll be talking about today are parasitoids. Generally, the difference is, well, I guess it depends on who you talk to or how you define it, but generally um, parasites won't kill the host or won't kill it immediately, where parasitoids will, I guess they won't kill it immediately either, but they grow in or on the host. Sometimes that's inside an egg, inside the larva, inside the adults, depends on the type of parasitoid you are. Um, but when they're done using the host, they will kill the host and leave it. And then predators are what you typically think of where they just catch the prey, eat it, kill it right then. And typically another good distinction, predators are larger than their prey, parasitoids are most typically smaller. So our first insect I wanted to talk to about today is the hoverfly. They're also called surfid flies. Um, and these are, there's hundred, several hundreds of species in this family, but most often they're wasp or bee mimics. And so sometimes they can get confusing. If you think you're looking at a bee, you're looking at a fly. Um, but some of those characteristics we talked about earlier for flies um, apply here where you've only got two wings, not two sets, just two, one set. Um, you'll have shorter antennae and really large um, eyes going on. You can also tell if they happen to have mouth parts that you can see uh, the flies will have a straw-like mouth part where the wasp will have mandibles and a tongue. So, and then I wanted to specifically highlight their larvae as well because these guys are um, some of the more beneficial, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but here's just a couple ways you can tell them apart from some similar larvae like alfalfa weevil or other caterpillars. Um, so the um, hoverfly larvae don't have a head capsule. They don't have eyes. They don't have legs either. Um, so sometimes they can be misidentified as the pests and then you end up getting rid of some of your beneficials. So um, just wanted to throw that up there. So why we like hoverflies, um, they're good at pollination. So that's always a benefit. They do look like bees and they pollinate like bees too. Um, they visit different flowers. So they help with pollination for wildflowers, soft fruits, and some agricultural crops. They are a fairly common fly um, out in field crops, orchards, gardens, home landscapes as well. Um, and then 
like I said, we care more, a little bit more about the larva because they are what uh, is beneficial in terms of biocontrol. Um, they tend to eat large amounts of soft-bodied pests, so those can be aphids, thrips, scale insects, and then the adults actually can feed on some invasive weeds like the musk thistle. So, so a couple ways we can keep these flies around, obviously pesticide reduction is going to be a big thing. Um, it's going to get mentioned a couple times tonight, but um, reducing your use of broad pesticides, um, using some softer or more narrow spectrum pesticides can be less damaging to um, helpful predators. Things like oils and soaps tend to be um, less damaging. And then of course, habitat planting. There are tons of flowers that you can plant here. I listed a couple of the families here on the slide that you can plant. Um, typically they like shallow open flowers. So those can be very beneficial to help keep the hoverflies around. Cool, next up we've got hornets, yellow jackets, and paper wasps, which can all be very similar, look very similar. Um, and then bees, of course, I threw up there as well because they're very close um, in size and shape. And so these are what we'll call the social wasps that we have here in Utah. All of these um, different types can sting you repeatedly, aside from the bees, um, the social wasps can. Um, they have smooth stingers, so that lets them sting repeatedly, whereas bees have the barbed stingers, so they can only sting you once. That being said, they typically only sting for defensive purposes, and 90% of all of those stings are going to be by the yellow jackets. Um, so one of the big differences between all of these guys is how they nest. Um, hornets and paper wasps nest above ground while yellow jackets tend to have their nests either on the ground or in the ground. So some fun differences there. And then here are the most common of each type. So we have the western yellow jacket. These are like I said the most aggressive. These tend to be the guys that'll fly up to you if you're eating outside, try to steal your food, um, kind of bug you. They will defend their colony without too much provocation, so you have to be a little bit careful with them um, there. And you can tell them apart from the European paper wasp because they have a little bit, they're a little bit chunkier um, and they have more of a difference between the, um, how the waste is defined. It's a little more abrupt where that waste is. Um, and so that's a couple ways you can tell them apart from the European paper wasp. And then the bald-faced hornet is pretty easy to tell apart from the rest. It's the most common hornet we have in Utah and they're black and white. So they're fairly easy with their coloration um, against all these yellow and black wasps. Um, and the hornets tend to be a lot more docile. Don't, they rarely sting, so um, not too bad. And then the Western paper wasp, we have a couple different species that are native to um, Utah. The Western paper wasp is the most common that we have. Um, and paper wasps in Utah that are native can have yellow or red colorations to them um, as compared to the European paper wasp, which showed up in Utah around 1995 um, and is quickly becoming the most dominant. These are probably what most of you recognize as um, wasps that are flying around. So some of the benefits and conservation for our social wasp. Obviously, some people would not consider these wasps beneficial. They can harm humans or other animals, but they're really good generalist predators. So they'll attack just about anything. Um, they'll even forage in you know, your food and trash, all kinds of things. But they help take out caterpillars, some flies, beetle larvae, and some true bugs as well. Um, and so the big one there is the caterpillars. I'm sure I don't have to tell a lot of you that caterpillars will cause tons of unwanted plant damage. So leaving these guys alone is actually very beneficial. If you don't take down their nests, particularly throughout the summer. Um, and then in addition, you can leave some old bird houses and they can adopt those into some nesting sites. And then next up is our tachinid fly. Um, so this is our first predator fly. You can tell them apart from some other flies because they have these really dark, thick bristles on their 
abdomen. They're about the same size as a housefly and they can be fairly variable in coloration. There's about a thousand species of them in North America. So quite a few different types of them. So again, we like these guys because they're pollinators. They have a nice, all those nice bristles to help catch the pollen, um, carry them around. And then I apologize, I said it wrong earlier. These guys are parasitoids, not predators. Um, had it wrong there. But they will lay their eggs on um, caterpillars. And so they're what's called an endoparasitoid. So that's them laying their egg on the outside of the host. And then um, it, again, there's lots of species. So some will lay it on the outside, some will um, lay it even on the food nearby. Um, and that's how they'll get into the host, but kind of cool stuff. The larvae will hatch out of those eggs, burrow into the host and then feed off of it. Usually somewhere between four and 14 days before they chew out. Um, and usually at that point they're killing that host. So um, because there's so many different species of this fly, they really have a wide range of the hosts. But a couple of ways you can keep them around are having season long pollen and nectar producing plants like dill, fennel, and asters. Those are things like sunflowers, other very open flowers. And of course, just the more diversity you have, the more predators you're gonna have even besides just um, flies, so. Yeah, and then this is one is a tachinid fly. It's just a specific kind. And unfortunately it breaks our rule of having those thick bristles. So there's always gotta be one exception to the rule, but. They're about the size of a housefly. They have a black or orange head, orange abdomen, and then they have these really cool fringes on their hind legs. Um, so those fringes, again, help with some pollination. And then specifically why we care about this species is they do biocontrol of squash bugs and other true bugs. Um, so they will lay their... Uh, the adult uh, fly will la lay its egg on the squash bug. There's a couple pictures here. One egg is on its head, one is on the underside of it. And then there's a cool picture. Um, that brown egg case next to it is actually how big, it's not an egg case, looks like an egg case. It's actually a pupa. And so that's how big they'll get eventually. Um, so it's kind of a cool comparison to see how large the larva will be before bursting out of there. So kind of cool. You can see just the little tiny eggs and how far they go feeding off of their host. Um, and I know a lot of people are concerned about squash bugs. So these are a good solution to that. Um, one field say, survey in California showed that about 50% of the squash bug population there was parasitized by this fly. So uh, I think that's a pretty good amount for that. And then again, providing constant nectar sources throughout the seasons is going to be beneficial for them. Cool. And then next up, we've got parasitoid wasps. So there are so many different parasitoid wasps, some that are very generalist, some that are more specialists. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of my favorites, some that I think particularly home gardeners might care about. Um, but I wish I could talk about them all, but we just don't have time for that. Um, so parasitoid wasps in general will lay their eggs in or on their prey. Um, sometimes that's the adult, like I said, sometimes that's eggs or larva, but the parasitoids will always emerge as an adult. And then because there's so many different species, they can be fairly variable in their size, shape, and color. Um, so something that you can do to promote it is to have very shallow nectar pollen sources around. Um, you can do that by strip cropping. If you have crops, um, planting flower strips in between the crops you're actually trying to grow can be very helpful. Diversifying the crops on the farm in general, or it's been shown that having a woody edge to the habitat really um, affects and increases the abundance of parasitoid wasps. Um, I don't know how fast you could grow a woody edge, but maybe purposely planting your crops next to it could be a good idea. To, if you're trying to promote the parasitoid wasps. And I think this image on the top right is a really cool one. Um, I feel like this one gets a lot of popularity out there with how many times it gets seen, but really cool example of just how many different little wasp cocoons are on that hornworm. 
So here's a couple, I'm not going to go into great detail, but here's a couple more pictures of some common um, parasitoid wasps. Um, I want to highlight these, some main pests they can control. On the bottom left, we have um, an asogaster species that's parasitizing codling moth, which can be a really um, problematic moth. And so um, I, as I was looking some stuff up, it said that if you don't use insecticides in unsprayed trees, about 40% of the coddling moth eggs will actually be parasitized. Um, so you might actually have better control without spraying sometimes. Um, and then some of the other ones highlighted here control the Japanese beetle, which is a invasive that we're trying to help control. And then also leaf rollers and aphids are a big one, which I'll go into some actual detail about um, aphid parasitoids in a minute. So this is the trichogramma wasp. Um, this one's fairly um, talked up in the literature. It's one that we like. Um, so it's just a tiny little guy, tiny, really gnat size. You probably wouldn't notice it. It's got a yellow body, some red eyes. Um, and like I said, pretty small. You probably wouldn't know what you're looking at. Probably wouldn't know it's a wasp either. So kind of interesting. But these guys are really big biocontrol for moths, sawflies, and butterflies. You can actually commercially purchase these guys for um, their benefits of biocontrol, which I think is pretty cool. Um, usually the adults will emerge in the spring, and then the females will lay a single one of her eggs inside a host egg. So you can see in some of those images, the eggs would typically be a light color, but then when they're parasitized, they'll turn dark and then the wasp will chew its way out once it's an adult. So yeah, pretty cool. Again, conservations, a lot of, we're talking about a lot of the same stuff, but just having a continuous source of flowers that have some shallow nectar reserves, increasing your floral diversity and reducing insecticides in general. Um, little tiny parasitoid wasps like this can be fairly susceptible to different types of insecticides. Um, Particularly, there's some research coming out that's saying um, that some of the organic reduce risks uh, pesticides that have been designated so are actually more damaging to small parasitoid wasps like this. So it can be a hard balance for sure. So I wanted to talk specifically about parasitoid wasps on aphids. I know that in the greenhouse, on some of the flowers I'm trying to grow, we have aphid problems and um, they can be very annoying. They have fast growing populations, so we gotta have a pretty good parasitoid wasp to combat that. So they're called burconid wasps. They can look fairly similar to ants if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, they're long and skinny, but they do have very long, thin antennae. And so obviously, like I said, we care about these because of the biocontrol of aphids. And again, you can help keep them around because, or with nectar plants with small flowers. Um, some of the good ones for that are dill, parsley, some mustard flowers, white clover, sunflowers, buckwheat, all sorts of flowers are pretty good for that. Um, and you guys may have seen these little aphid mummies before, what they're called. Um, so once the so the wasps will overwinter inside their dead aphid hosts, um, and then the adults will emerge in the spring, and then they can lay an egg. A female wasp can lay a single egg in up to 300 aphids. So as fast as aphids reproduce, it's really nice to have a wasp that can do up to 300 aphids at a time. So they'll lay their egg inside and then the little larvae will feed for five to 12 days. And then after they stop feeding, um, the parasitized aphids will stop feeding and then they'll be stuck to the leaf in kind of this mummy state. They'll swell um, with that pupating wasp inside of them. And then the wasp will create that circular, circular hole you can see in some of the images and they'll crawl out and then they'll leave behind these empty aphid mummy shells. And so I know that the pest diagnostician here gets quite a few questions of what is this weird thing? And it's an aphid mummy is what they're called. So pretty cool stuff. They have 
that very high egg laying ability. And then these wasps also have very quick generation time, which leads to them being a fairly effective um, control. And you can purchase these guys as well, which is very helpful. Maybe I should do that for my own greenhouse problems. And then last up, I wanna talk about parasitoid wasps on stink bugs. Like Nick said, that's what I do research on. So of course, this is my favorite topic, um, which I could talk all day about. But so I study these little tiny, they look like little ants, little gnats, um, little black wasps that are parasitoids for stink bugs. And so the main one that I focus on are Trisulcus species. And so we have some of these that are native, and then we also have some that are non-native. And so the reason I care about this, the reason I have funding and can do research is because of the brown marmorated stink bug. And so we do have other stink bug populations that we would like to control. Native stink bugs here can cause some damage, but the brown marmorated stink bug is the big hitter in terms of causing fruit damage. Um, they have over 300 host plants, so they're really knocking out most of the fruit and nut crops particularly. Um, so we really care about finding a solution for the brown marmorated stink bug and that's what I'm looking into. So we have our native wasps here in Utah and they do pretty well on the native stink bugs but then because the brown marmorated stink bug is an invasive from Asia they don't have a natural predator here. Well didn't until fairly recently and that's when this non-native Trisulcus japonicus um, that I'm going to talk about came and it actually showed up on its own um, originally in Maryland and then we actually had it show up on its own here in Utah and with some genetic testing we did find out that it's a different genetic strain than some of the others in the United States so Utah is so far unique so kind of interesting stuff but these guys are egg parasitoids where they lay their own egg inside stink bug eggs and then emerge as full-grown adults. So yeah, I do research on Trisulcus japonicus. Its common name is the samurai wasp. Um, pretty cool name if you ask me. But a couple, the three projects that I'm mainly working on involve detection, floral resources, and then chiromones. So in terms of detection, I'm looking at where it is in Utah. We only saw it show up in 2019, so it's still fairly new. So keeping track of where it's at. Um, is really important. And I'm also doing a study where I have these yellow sticky cards up in orchards, and I'm looking at how different ground cover, if there's lots of flowers, if it's just dirt, if there's grass, if that affects how many wasps we're finding, um, so that we can possibly make recommendations to growers in the future about what might help, um, which bleeds very well into my next objective that I've been working on, which is the floral resources. So a current, a constant theme throughout this talk is kind of, we need diversity, we need different flowers that um, all the different wasps and flies can feed on. Um, because this little wasp is so incredibly tiny, we don't know a whole lot about what it needs to sustain itself. We know it needs nectar resources, but not necessarily which flowers. So I'm doing some testing to figure out which flowers help it um, live its longest life and be most, reproductively successful. And then chiromones, you guys may have heard of pheromones, very similar idea, but that's what the stink bugs are giving off that are attracting these wasps. And so I've actually had some custom lures made that have some stink bug pheromones in them. And I'm trying to see if I can use those to attract wasps. And those, that could be pretty helpful in the future um, to see if we can attract wasps to the areas that we find stink bugs and increase how much they're parasitizing and controlling the stink bug population. So cool, really cool stuff there. We're tending to find um, both our native and this um, non-native wasp in more urban areas than orchard areas, even though orchards are where we're much more concerned about the control of stink bugs. So we're seeing if we can kind of shift them over to where we want them. And lastly, if you guys see a parasitoid wasp, you have a couple options. So option one is that you can leave the egg and parasitoid alone. Um, that's kind of the preferred option because you might have a bunch more parasitoid wasps, which will just help whatever problems, pest problems you might be having. 
Um, so best option, just leave it all alone if you find a parasitoid on an egg mass. Uh, your second option is you can wave off the parasitoid and then you can freeze or destroy the eggs. Um, and this goes for stink bug eggs or whatever other pest eggs. Um, if you don't want them, that is an option, but please chase off the parasitoid first, don't kill it. And then your third option is to collect that parasitoid and bring it to me or Zach Shum, the diagnostician here. Um, and we'd love to see what it is. It might help us in trying to detect and find some things. And here on the right, I just wanted to show you guys, this is a current map of where, well, current as of last year, we don't have this summer's data in there yet, but this is where we're finding the samurai wasps so far. Um, the year before that, it was only kind of found around Salt Lake. So we're seeing it expand, which is always a good sign. Um, we're hoping it expands to all the places that the brown marmorated stink bug is and that we can have some pretty good control going on there. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to both the beneficial insects we talked about today and to you guys for being a good audience.